Uh, hit it, Steve. Thanks. You may think it hubris if I compare the divisiveness of antebellum America with what we're going through now, but I've never let hubris stop me before. <laughs> Doubly so to compare my method of navigating it with Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, first published in 1856 when he was 37. In an effort to encourage people to connect more deeply with each other, he wrote, I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Now I paraphrase, I, now 57 years old in clearly imperfect health, begin closer to my next colonoscopy than my last, begin. I remember like it was yesterday, a crisp, light snow wafted gently onto my suburban New Jersey cul-de-sac, barely on the hopeful side of the winter solstice, the longest and darkest day of 1972. The muffled sounds of nearby Route 1, it was, it was 7.40 p.m., yet dark as midnight. I stood alone, watching the snowflakes float past a streetlight that failed to fully penetrate the darkness. Because the six-year-olds were allowed to do that in the 1970s, right? Just walk around the neighborhood alone in the dark. <laughs> I may not have been able to articulate it clearly at the time, but I remember feeling the general unease of those years. But in stark contrast to that unease, on that Friday night, as with every Friday night during those years, I was filled with hopeful anticipation. I idly shuffled through the dark, white silence, knowing that in 20 minutes I would once again experience the world in a completely different light. Because at 8 o'clock, every Friday night, well, here's the story. No matter how ambiguously unsettling 1972 may have felt, one thing was certain. This family knew how to resolve a conflict. <laughs> there was no catastrophe these guys could weather, couldn't weather in 30 minutes. I frequently compared my family to theirs and remember getting upset when I came up short. And truth be told, I still do. But it was, it was more than the Bradys, right? right? It was the box itself and how it shaped what we thought and how we felt. And it was the beginning of a journey that took me and my generation, I think, farther away from each other, uh, despite its perennial promises to do j just the opposite. For example, in 1984, as I was running toward college, this gal iconoclastically ran through a Super Bowl ad and smashed old big brother in order to, uh, I'm not sure, Ridley Scott, who directed Alien, Blade Runner, and this commercial never really specified. Uh, it was, however, a, a pivotal point for our generation because from then on, the box was no longer a conveyor of expectation. It was, the box itself was the thing. The Bradys and the Ricardos before them may have sold our generation unrealistic answers, but at least we knew what the problems were. Apple got us all worked up in 1984 simply to sell us 128K of this. And gosh help you if you didn't keep up. For example, after college, I tried unsuccessfully to position myself on the profitable side of the box, but like Tantalus's dinner, the tech remained elusive. My first job trained me as an expert digital typesetter three years before the internet blossomed. Then I learned just enough HTML to make me obsolete three years after that. Meanwhile, year after year, the gadgets fell out of the sky like so much electronic manna, and we gobbled them up. I, not to dismiss the conveniences that they bring. I mean, we certainly enjoy them to this day, but my connection with you, to you, uh, despite growing wider and farther and faster, grew shallower. Then in 2006, as I was running toward California and away from my first marriage, this guy ran into our imaginations with a big stack of promises to deepen our connections in a way those gadgets couldn't. And for a while, we rode that wave, and we got cockily optimistic for a few years until it was discovered that birthdays and kittens and pictures of your Greek Isle vacation did not fuel the box as efficiently as did conflict, anger, and outrage. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe this isn't anything new. I mean, my understanding of and my feelings about the world in general and the previous generation in particular were influenced, filtered by the technology, sure. But it still stings a bit, though, as time now pivots me, kicking and grumbling into becoming the object of that outrage. However, none of these filters could ever have prepared me for the most vitriolic generational hatred ever devised by human or by box, and I mean, of course, the TikTok and its comment threads, which arrived on the scene around the same time I arrived in Bozeman. The anger is exhausting because despite everything our generation may have accomplished, uh, we are now uh, apparently the sole reason why everything sucks. 
I don't, entirely, it's, I don't think it's entirely the text fault, but it sure isn't bringing us together the way we, it promised. So I grab my phone, try to play along, open the app, and lumber to my own defense. But for me, the hardest part of pushing back is the nagging possibility that they may have a point. So I give up and ruefully board the old people are laughably inept at technology bus, and I say, screw it, I'm a poet now. But the box makes the boxes now and writes screenplays and designs clothing and generates Pecha Kucha slides. Perhaps you're familiar with Carl Sharrow's now famous tweet that totally nailed it. He said, humans doing the hard jobs on minimum wage while the robots write poetry and paint is not the future I wanted. Which brings us right here and right now in this room, this celebration of human experiences now in light of recent developments, so much more than what it was originally intended for. This immediacy where me and you become us, this moment right here is literally redefining what it means to be human. This is something the box for now can't duplicate. So 50 years later, I'm still standing in the snow wondering how it's all going to play out. But I'm hopeful as together, together we are forced to rethink authentic human connection and what it really means and feels like. Whitman finishes his song, I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me, again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another I stop somewhere waiting for you. Thank you.